Hi, I'm Stunning Stella Cheeks. And I'm the Enigma Aaron Klein. And this is Not Not Your Your Demographic. Demographic. We used to be a feminist wrestling podcast. Shockingly, we'd rather talk about literally anything else now. podcast host on the internet once again we live here this is where we live <laughs> how are you oh dreadful <laughs> absolutely dreadful <laughs> i know like i was like this is not a question i really want to be asking no. but like uh, it's the format of the podcast oh <laughs> uh, absolutely dreadful uh i'm f- physically i'm fine baby's fine all that is fine uh i got some absolutely awful news this week um you know, fuck cancer. I don't really want to go into it. I don't want to blow up their spot, but somebody I care a lot about with got uh, diagnosed with a really shitty type of cancer. And so I've had a fucking awful couple of weeks, uh, basically since we recorded the last episode, it's been like a downhill trek from there, man. (laughs) But you know, other than that, I guess, uh, deeply uncomfortable all the time. You know, I had to have an ultrasound this morning that lasted so long it was so long they were like oh your your bladder looks really full i was like yeah you told me to do that you make me not pee and then you press on it and there's already a thing inside of me this is not fun yeah i was like this blows after a while she was like do you just want to go to the bathroom and i was like yes yeah 100% yes i want to fucking go to the bathroom (laughs) so uh having one of those days it's been a rough ride how are you Pretty standard for me. (laughs) (laughs) I've been painting ceilings and walls today. Got a lot of paint in my hair. I got a big glob of paint in my eye. I'm glad I still have vision. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) I'm overworked, sleep deprived, anxious all the time. I like to play this game every day called Am I Anxious or Am I Furious? <laughs> so it's not really, mutually exclusive. It's pretty fun. <laughs> My therapist is like, you need to keep some snacks in your car because you don't eat enough and you get angry too easy. And I think that eating more would maybe help. <laughs> oh, like, maybe. Okay. I'll get some fruit roll ups, I guess. <laughs> Hell yeah. Get some fruit snacks. That's what. I keep a fruit snack in my fanny pack at all times. It's like my pregnancy emergency kit. Because the same thing will happen to me. I'm like, I want to murder everyone I see. Oh, I'm starving. (laughs) Oops. My bad. Yeah. My anger trigger is very, very uh, overworked these days. (laughs) So threshold, it's low. (laughs) It's low. Uh, It's very low. (laughs) So that's how I am. My ceiling, you know, painting a ceiling, this is my rant, so I'll I'll save it. But, you know, painting a ceiling is the worst thing in the world. That's my own personal hell. You know how, like, in some mythology, like, everyone gets their own, like, personalized hell. And oh, mine yeah. is just an eternity spent painting a ceiling. <laughs> 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 With roads to the top playing in the background. Oh, my God. <laughs> how did you do that to yourself? It's hell, Erin! I refuse to watch it. I absolutely oh, I did not watch refuse. it. I'm just, if I had a personal, I turn the channel so fast when that comes on. I've not seen more than 10 seconds of it. I'm just saying, if I had a personalized hell. I see. Okay. Then, I would yeah, be painting that's... a ceiling and roads to the top would be on. <laughs> oh, woof. <laughs> Drive anyone mad. Uh, let's, who cares? Everybody's life's tough. You know, everything's a scam. Everything's terrible. But we're, you know, we're here for you, the listener. <laughs> yep. Still here. Laughing Still doing through, it. Laughing through uh, despair. <laughs> what have you been reading? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> this so is unprepared. the concept of the show. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so unready. Um as typical, I finished three books since the last time we talked. Um, yeah, that's your like, that's your that's pace. Like, that's my pace now. I've just established this is how many books I finish every time. Um, all right, let's start with the worst one. So uh, the the National Book Review long list came out, which means that my hold list is a fucking nightmare now <laughs> because I'm like, let me just request all of these, not all of them. 
I'm the worst. I don't even read the descriptions. I just go through and I go, do I know this author? Have I read this book? Cool, I'll request it. Do I know this author? No. Have I read this book? No. Is the cover cool? Cool, I'll request it. <laughs> so, Look, we I'm all have our criteria, and that is yours. Right? And I, I've said it many times, like, covers are important. That's People pick books based on covers, and so that, especially for the long list, because not all of them wind up on the short list. That's just how I pick which ones I'm going to read from the long list. And then if I didn't pick one that winds up on the short list, I'll just request most of the short list right. too. So eventually I'll get around to the short list. But I looked at the l- list and I got to say some very uninspiring covers. This yeah. Year. That was like not a lot of good ones. Whatever. Like <laughs> there were a couple that I was just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> this is poor design. Uh, but one of the poetry long list ones is called, Twice Alive by Forrest Gander. Forrest Gander won the Pulitzer for poetry a couple years ago. So I was like, okay, this is, I've never read any of his stuff, but. Wait, his name is is... Forrest Gander? Yes, correct. That's a fake name, right? That's got to be a fake name. Forrest Gander. I wrote a book of poetry about mushrooms. That's fake. I know. Absolutely. (laughs) That's all fake. Everything's a scam. (laughs) It's all a scam. So. All right, this book is called Twice Alive, and it's literally about fungus and mushrooms and plants. And Which so sounds it's all cool. Yeah, that's why, why I picked it. I looked at the cover, and I was like, oh, interesting. And so then I read through what it was about, and I was like, this sounds dope. This is, like, right up my alley. This is long-listed. That means it must be good. Incorrect. Not true. <laughs> Not the case. It was... Okay, so here's my biggest complaint about it. The concept sounds very cool, and the first couple poems I really enjoyed, but it just got, unshockingly, so pretentious. It just turned into this, like, exercise in absolute pretentiousness. It felt very condescending in lots of ways, but I was just like, ugh, this is bullshit. And then, like, three-fourths of the way through, it just turns into poems about sex. Not about fungus at all, just like a couple of weird poems about fucking in the forest. And I was like, what the hell is this? And my biggest complaint, and this is why I do not recommend this book, is there was one about someone who was on like a nature hike with a couple of other people. And they wrote it where the person was speaking in first person, but referred to themselves as we. And I was like, okay, maybe this is like part of like the twice alive, the like lichen grows off of other things. That's yeah. how fungus We're works. in a mycelium. We're together. We live as a community. Right. You would think that. But then they made this comment where the guide is talking to them and they said to the guide, we prefer to use gender neutral pronouns and said it in a way that was like, this is so fucking condescending. And I looked it up because I was like, maybe this person is non-binary. Maybe this person is like a gender neutral person. Nope. It's nope. just a dude. Just a cishet dude. And I was like, <laughs> fuck this. This is such bullshit. It just felt like I think that pronouns and they thems are stupid. And so I'm going to write this poem where this person refers to themselves as we and then gets talked down to by this forest guy. And I was like, that's that on that for me. But because it was, I was like, maybe it's just the one, maybe it's just this one poem. And then the further you get into a poetry book, it's like, well, I can't put it down now. I've got like 20 pages. Yeah. Left. <laughs> it's this Bam. big. It's a wee book. I might as well I, it's finish a wee it. Book. It took me like an hour and 10 minutes to finish the whole thing. And I was just like, I've got to suck it up and do it. And I do not recommend it. It's, and like, I love poetry. I love contemporary poetry. I read so fucking much of it. And even stuff I don't care for or that isn't necessarily for me, I can usually find a couple of things that I'm like, okay, it's worth reading for this couple of poems. This wasn't even worth it. Even the first few that were good, I was just like, nah, this is... This is just so up its own butt. I just can't. And it didn't get shortlisted. And I was like, good. Fuck this <laughs> Fuck this fuck poetry this book. Sucks. Fuck this poetry book. Uh, the next one that I finished, real, total opposite. Really fucking good. Velvet Was the Night by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, who also wrote Mexican Gothic, which is also fucking amazing. And I cannot recommend highly enough. Velvet, is, Velvet Was the Night was so fucking good. Yeah, so it's sitting good. on my nightstand. I haven't started it, but it's sitting on my Uh, nightstand just staring at me. It's so good. I think you're really going to like it. It's a mystery. It's a noir mystery. She, like, much like Mexican Gothic was written in the 
like gothic romance style where it's very particular to that kind of style and like the whole time I kept screaming why don't you burn the fucking house down <laughs> like but because <laughs> of the way that she forms the stories like it's the payoff when you get to the end of Mexican gothic is so fucking worth it that it's like I'm willing to put up with these um uh tropes within gothic literature because that's what this is. This this book is built on this. And this noir book right. is very similar. Where, it's in like, the title. Yeah. Like, you're going to figure out... It's a mystery. But it's not a gaslighting mystery. But it is a mystery. And you're going to figure out... Ex they're looking for film. And you're going to figure out where the film is fucking immediately. Because I did. And I was like... Yeah, but that's part of the charm of noir, right? Is that exactly. like... Exactly. To me, I like noir in a way that I don't like mystery. Because a lot of capital M mysteries are dumb and gaslighty, but noir is so genre that it's like, it's yes. not, it's not about the mystery. It's about the like archetypes and the characters and stuff. Exactly. Like, so noir yes. feels different than me for yes. different for me. Yeah, absolutely. And so like, and by the time you, you get to the reveal and you're like, I fucking knew it. I was like, I don't even care about this reveal. I just want to get to the other side of the reveal. Cause now I'm so excited that everyone else knows what I knew from the like very beginning, basically. And like, it's two main characters and a, a man and a woman. And the woman is, see, here's the thing. I have been very vocal about, I fucking hate dumb as hell characters. I, they drive me nuts. It will ruin a book for me. <laughs> this woman is dumb as hell and it works because it's so specific to the genre. And she right. is such a great noir character that by the time I got to the end, I was like, rooting for her in a way i almost <laughs> never do for dumb as hell character like almost too dumb to be alive but yet somehow here you are like it was she's just sylvia and marina garcia is just such a fucking great writer and i love love that all of her stuff is set time period specific in mexico because yeah, I it's never really read, cool i never read anything like that and like and she's not a translated author she writes in english too which i i like a lot that the, a native English writer is writing something that's so specific to her heritage that that feels very natural. It doesn't feel like it's being shoehorned in. It doesn't feel like a white author who has chosen this time and place for X Y Z reasons. Like it just feels like this is the way she writes, and it, it was just so fucking good. I didn't want to put it down. I was like, I would get into bed at night and I would read like 40 pages and be like I I have to go to sleep <laughs> like I'm so fucking tired <laughs> I have to put this book down and then I would get up in the morning and be like I have to read more of this so I cannot recommend it enough it was so fucking good I didn't know that she'd written like eight books so now I'm like well shit I should read her other books too because yeah, I, I didn't know she had written so, so, so many either I didn't know she was so prolific I I don't know why but I thought Mexican Gothic was her first so did I, I. And then uh, I we are wrong her. I know, and I read through her author's list and was like, shit, I should read some of these other ones. So I love anyways. doing that. I love finding an author that you love and then being like, oh, I'm going to just read the shit out of them. Actually, two in my list are like authors that I'm like meticulously working through their like back catalog. Yes, absolutely. If anyone listening has read any of Sylvia Moreno Garcia's stuff and has a particular recommendation from her back catalog, let me know because I I have no idea where to start. <laughs> I assume it's all good, but if someone has a favorite, I would love to know about that. At the beginning, the it's a very good place to start. Come on. Yeah, that's true, but it's hard because with <laughs> <laughs> dork, uh, <laughs> but all, but sometimes like. Sometimes the first two books in an author's debut are their best work. And so sometimes right. it's like, oh, you can skip those ones. They're not super great. The third one is like one of the best books they've ever written. Like, I, I don't I like understand. I'm a completist. That means yeah. nothing to me. <laughs> Fair enough. That's true. You love torturing yourself. <laughs> and then the last book I finished um, is Ornamental by Juan Cardenas. This is a translated book. Um, he's a Colombian author. This was translated by uh, Lizzie Davis. I really liked this book. I'm going to say this with a caveat that I loved this. It was, I was reading it and I was like, oh my God, this is like one of the best books I've read all year. I fucking, I love this so much. And then like four fifths of the way through, it switches perspective to a different character. And that character writes uninterrupted paragraphs for 10 pages. And I was You're like- You're fucking cursed. 
I'm hurt. I never, I don't know what it is about you. Maybe it's just because I read like lowbrow trash that like I never, ever pick up a book that somebody is like uninterrupted paragraphs, no punctuation. And it is <sighs> truly a fucking curse for you. It is a curse and I fucking hate it. I felt like, I, I literally felt attacked. I was like, I cannot fucking believe this. Like my very specific pet peeve has come to fucking haunt me. I was this so angry. This is your angry. personal hell. You are in a Ugh. room full of, it's your Twilight Zone episode. You're in, it's the end of the world and you're in a room, you're trapped in a room full of books and you can't leave because it's the nuclear apocalypse. But at least you have this room full of books and it's all uninterrupted paragraphs. No p- punctuation. Oh my God. <laughs> Skin uh, <laughs> crawl. That's oh, your Twilight it. Zone episode. <laughs> See, barf. Oh my god. Uh, it's so awful. And like, in the end, I would still recommend this book. I, I really liked it. It doesn't go on like that for the rest of the book. It switches back to the original narrator who writes normally. Thank fucking god. But so this book is about. It's set in like a, a near future dystopia. There, it's. It seems like it's Columbia, but that's only because I know that this art, that this author is Colombian and that that's where he's living. But it's kind of a, it could be anywhere story. And it could be basically any time past tomorrow, near future dystopia. There's been some kind of like civil unrest, but it's not clear what it does. It's not clear if there's a war that caused it, but what's the, the story is about a, um, a pharmacologist, basically a drug scientist who's working on a recreational drug that only works for women. And so he's doing this study of these four subjects about how they react to this drug. And one of them reacts in a way that, so the idea of the drug is that it, it's kind of like ecstasy. It creates this very euphoric state, but they're trying to like tweak the way that the formula works because sometimes it just puts them to sleep but then this fourth subject talks in these like um these she says she talks in these really long monologues that seem like they could be real but seem like they couldn't be real and so the researcher becomes like obsessed with her basically and then develops this like this happens very early so this isn't like spoiled but develops this like relationship with her and so then the rest of the book is about how his relationship with his wife is impacted by this relationship that he's formed with this test subject, basically. And then what happens once the drug reaches past the clinical trials and how it impacts like the greater um, society that they're in. And it was fucking fascinating. I thought it was super well written. The book is only like 129 pages. So it's super, super short. It was a very quick read, but then the, the subject subject number four everyone is unnamed which i love i i'm a big fan of that that kind of writing too so i was like aha a perfect book for me oh man (laughs) but the subject number four becomes the narrator towards the end and she's the one who speaks in these unbroken paragraphs which like makes sense because that's what she was doing when she was under this clinical study and so it's not like totally unfounded and it doesn't feel like a choice that makes absolutely no sense. It was just like me personally being like, yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> Why again? Why is this happening again? It's your curse. Your curse. It's my curse. But in, I, I also really liked the end. I liked the way that the, when it switches back to the original narrator, he refers to the subject and her, and this like 10 page spread that you just read and like interprets it for you basically which i really liked it wasn't like you were just left to to decide was this real was this not real what of this what sense am i supposed to make of this so i really liked it i would definitely recommend it i thought that i requested this because it was on the the fiction long list for the national book award it's not i have no idea where this was recommended to me it must have shown up on like an instagram account and i was like that looks cool i'll read this book next (laughs) but it's very good i definitely recommend it so ornamental highly recommend it with the caveat that if you cannot deal with unbroken paragraphs this is gonna bug you for like 10 pages (laughs) but other than that i did really enjoy it what have you finished I bet your books. No, it's fine. I bet your bookstagram is so different than mine. Mine is just like all like erotica and romance, and yours is probably (laughs) all like poetry and like national book awards. And mine's just like this person gets railed. (laughs) (laughs) I've got a bunch of like indie book accounts too, so I feel like that's how I get this shit. Where I think that what I'm reading are like nominated for a bunch of awards, and then it's just like wild out of left field bullshit. (laughs) 
this is why book clubs are important because I would not read. You know, I read good stuff. I just read very heavily genre stuff, and like yes, I would not read so. a lot of uh, <laughs> nationally acclaimed books otherwise. <laughs> yeah, and I would read almost no smut, so it's bringing color into my yeah. life. Book clubs are important, <laughs> <laughs> and neither of us read, read books only about death if it wasn't for possess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I finished six books. Four are hardcover or paperback and two are audiobooks. I did finish The American Dream, which is a play that we talked about last time, which you said you like the Zoo Story better. I thought American yeah. Dream was so much better. Zoo Story has a lot of really? Zoo Story has like a lot of realism into it and it's like absurdist it's absurd in that they're like having a weird interaction but it like it is something that like could happen whereas american dream is like we're really yes. really just going for it and i love absurdist plays from like the 60s and also i love edward alby like who's afraid of virginia wolf is one of my unshocking favorite plays of all time so like i i love the grandma character i love that everybody just had like Ugh. i'm mother i'm father i'm grandma the grandma character is so good where she's like you think that i don't i'm not paying attention because i'm old I got it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, to be fair, that's the character you would play for sure, 100%. <laughs> I just, yeah, and it, it was just such a scathing, whereas, like, Zoo Story is, like, kind of a, like, oh, middle America, like, uh, like, it's maybe not great, whereas American Dream was, like, a scathing takedown of, like, the the American Dream and what we think of as, like, you know, goals in our society and, like, I, I thought it was so good. So I finished that. I finally finished Tiny Crimes, Very Short Tales of Mystery and Murder. Yeah. I had a harder time getting through it because I don't love mystery as much. There was a lot of murder. Tiny Horrors was just so much better and was so yeah. compelling. But there were a few stories that I really, really liked. Like I liked, I think the first one may have been one of my favorites where all of the killers had the same name. I yes. thought that one was really cool. Um, there were some good noir ones. My favorite, though, was the story of the brother who kept killing his sisters and his family members. And the sisters would come in and be like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't I found them like this. And then they would be yes. like, I have to get help. And he's like, oh, I really wish you would have made a different decision. And just like the revolving door of murders, I thought was really interesting. I don't think I think if you like short stories, it's definitely worth it because, again, they are. Mm -hmm very tiny stories uh but tiny micro fiction yeah. yeah they're micro fiction but tiny horrors i th i thought was better and honestly well, like oh go ahead I was, gonna, I was just gonna say i feel like tiny horrors learned from the first one where like it's got the four sections there sure. it's a little it's like divided up in a way that makes a little more sense i feel like they the they art learned in the tiny horrors makes a lot more sense the like art in tiny crimes is just like fucking random and i was like yeah it's i bizarre. don't know what the fuck this means yes i would agree with that <laughs> Um, still good, but like not my favorite short story book. I read We Sold Our Souls by Grady Hendrix, which is my final oh. of his fiction books. So speaking of oh, working shit. through somebody's uh, library. So We Sold Our Souls was really fucking good. It was super good. It's about a, a metal band uh, who gets broken up. And you go into the future and they're all like middle aged or whatever, except for one of them is very, very famous because he like sold out or whatever. And then as in true like Grady Hendrix or like horror, whatever, as the narrator learns more, there's this like deep conspiracy. And like, you know how in metal, uh, this is not a spoiler. This comes out really early. You know how in metal there's like a lot of albums that are like, like a Guar album. It's like Guar is this, this fictional reality where there's like empires and like these monsters that you have to fight and, and metal is very like high fantasy and there's a lot of albums mm -hmm. that like tell a whole story so this band has an album like that but it's real and so this the main woman figures out that like oh no this album we wrote is actually like a prophecy and I have to figure it all out and it, it was super good it's like high fantasy horror also, if you love metal music, it was really, really, really fun. Highly recommend. I still think Final Girl Support Group is my favorite, but this would be up there. I, I really, really enjoyed it. 
cool. I just requested it because I was like, I obviously need to read this. Did you read Paperbacks from Hell? No, that's a nonfiction one. So I've read all this fiction. I I do want to. That's him like talking about like paperback horror. So I do want to read that one. But I have I have read all of his fiction novels now because he he is in he writes he writes female protagonists so well. And part of me wants to be like Bobby. I know you didn't like. Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, but I really think you should read this one because you like metal music. But this not. sounds way more up his alley. But I'm yeah. still afraid. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> like, oh, you broke our hearts. Please don't break them again. <laughs> don't break them again. But this one, like, because of the, like, mythos and the world building and, and it, yeah, it was super good. Highly recommend. Um, I read The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. I read it in 24 hours. I came home from shutting down a wedding. And so when I shut down a wedding, I'm out until like 1 a.m. And then I am like awake because I'm, you know, jacked from like lifting giant flower urns and whatever. From lifting, bro. Yeah, I'm jacked from lifting in the middle of the night. (laughs) So I was like, I don't want to read. I'm like, I don't want to read any fic and I don't want to read what I'm reading. Oh, I got this book in the mail. I'll just read this. It is fucking great. It is such a fun romance novel. So the idea is that this woman is in a PhD program. She's like studying. She's in like a biology PhD program. She breaks up with this guy and she didn't really like like him or whatever. You know how sometimes you date and you're like, oh, we're not really feeling it. But her best friend really likes that guy but refuses to go out with him even though the main character, Olive, is like, I don't like him. Go, you you like him. Date him. It doesn't matter that I dated him before. But she's like, no, that's like against the girl code or whatever. So Olive is like, yeah, Sorry, I'm people. going on a date. And I'm fine. So you'll see that I'm happy. So she, like, lies. And then she gets caught. So she kisses the first person that she sees. And it's like, I'm going to kiss you now. So that her best friend sees that she's, like, on a date. But she kisses this, like, the the guy who is, you know, the notorious grump in the department or whatever. <laughs> and they have to have this fake dating relationship. And it's really, really good. <laughs> and she is adorable and super smart and weird and anxious. And I love her. And, like, he is, like, a broody grump. But not – sometimes when there's, like, a broody male character, you're like, ugh, get over yourself. But, like, he – has a lot of like good reasons like people are like he's so mean on like my thesis defense thing blah 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 and he's like i'm not ever mean to the person i'm mean about the research because we are talking about like really important scientific like breakthroughs and like you can't just make shit up like sorry that i'm i'm my job is to make good scientists not give not give you a passing grade and it also really deals with like the woman who wrote it is an actual phd um in like neuroscience so all of the science is like really well explained and thought out and and then she also has like experience in like the halls of like bullshit academia so it has like a a really like true element because like sometimes when you read especially like me but like I read a lot of fic and you know the college professors is like a huge trope but sometimes you're like even my limited experience in academia I'm like this is not what it's like at all I'm sorry, but this one is, like, really rooted in reality. It's, like, a very over-the-play enemies to lovers, fake relationship, blah, 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 relationship, or uh, romance novel, but it is rooted in a lot of reality, which was great. And I loved it, and I read it in less than 24 hours, so highly recommend (laughs) The Love Hypothesis. This is also her first book, and she has this, like, she's given a bunch of interviews about how, like, she writes a lot, but it's a lot of, you know neuroscience academia papers so like it's totally different and to get a break from that she started writing fan fiction and like building community so she's like I basically learned how to write a novel or how to write fiction from like the fan community and like obviously I'm like I love community well a fandom so this sounds (laughs) right up your alley did you write this book (laughs) no but I want to be her friend it's it's such a good book like I think even though obviously like this was made for me or whatever like I I think I think any a romance layman would enjoy it it's really well written it's super cute it's got a dumb title I love it um the cover's good I saw that you posted it and I was like that's a good cover I like that cover a lot you know what you're getting into right like yep they're smooching. One of their eyes are open. Like, what is happening? <laughs> like, why am I being kissed? <laughs> um, so I so 
those are the ones that I read or finished, like, read or started pre-October. But my October, whatever, lots of people do, like, 31 days of horror, and they watch movies and stuff, but for, like, a reason that I can't do that. And But I'm newly, like, very into horror, so I was like, oh, I'll just read a bunch of fucking horror books. Or horror-adjacent books, spooky-ish books, because, like, I don't know. So I... Listen to Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas, which is a YA novel, but it's um, a trans novel. It is written by a trans man, narrated by a trans man, and the main character is a trans man. It's a Latinx book. It is so unique and interesting and so compelling and, and easy to read. The, the, the plot, that's the word. The plot is there is Yadriel is the main character, and... He lives in a cemetery with his family. Um, they're the Brujexes. So there's the Brujas and the Brujos. They're witches, essentially. and like, But they're really divided along like gender lines, how their powers manifest. The uh, Brujas are healers, essentially. And the Brujos can call ghosts, and they can also release ghosts. And Yadriel is like, I'm a man, I want to be a brujo. And they're like, no, you can't because you're like not a real man. A thing happens and Yadriel is like, I'm going to solve this problem for my family and like prove to them that I am a brujo, essentially. And so he does a bunch of secret espionage and, and becomes a, a brujo in his own right. And he solves this big mystery and he does it with the help of a teenage boy ghost and so there's like a romance like element to them too and there's like a found family which we know is my jam uh it is just really it was really really good and the audio uh book is also narrated specifically by a trans man like they went out of their way to make sure that it was like as authentic as possible so i really highly recommend it if you like ya if you like ghost stories if you want more lgbt stories in your life if you want more latinx stories in your life it was really really good highly recommend and then finally i finished reading the fireman by joe hill which is also like an an author who i've been like working through his back catalog this is my final one of his novels i still have to finish comic books but don't come at me lock and key is not my favorite so i'm really struggling with it the art is so bad i don't like it whatever but I this was my final one I had a couple friends who are like oh this is my favorite one this is my favorite one I don't it was good I liked the audiobook because it was Kate Mulgrew it was good because it's Joe Hill I like his style but I just don't like dystopian books like I don't know if it's just because like we basically live in a dystopia yeah. I know the point of a lot of horror and dystopia specifically is like oh, hell is other people. The real horrors are other people. (laughs) Like, I get it. Like, I know that the zombies are the monster. The people are the monsters. Like, I get it. But, like, it's just the type of, like, I I like monsters more than I like end-of-the-world scenarios. Like, that's part of the reason Nosferatu is is my favorite of his is because, like, Charlie Manx is a ridiculous, like, big bad villain. Like, that's the Mm -hmm. type of horror stuff that I'm more drawn to. And so while this was really good, it wasn't my favorite, mostly because I don't like dystopia stuff. But I did like that they had um, a deaf character that seemed like it was really well researched. So that was great to have um, that representation in the book. The narration is great because Kate Mulgrew rules. But I will say this is the second time I've read about a pandemic during a pandemic and I do not recommend it. (laughs) At least this why one. Why keep doing that? At least this one. First of all, Emily picked the book for our book club. At least yeah. this one was like a fake pandemic that was like, oh, we get dragon scale and we turn into fire instead of like, oh, this is a book about the 1918 flu epidemic that's very similar to the epidemic we're in. That's so insane. a little bit different. If you've never read a Joe Hill book, I would recommend reading Nosferatu uh, before you read The Fireman. That's my personal recommendation so those are the books i read what is your rant oh you know the american healthcare system and how it's a fucking oh, scam yeah. everything's a scam <laughs> everything's a scam i mean i've talked about this a lot I, again i don't want to super get into it because i don't want to blow up um uh, my loved one's spot uh against their will but yeah i it's i've been uh 
I have ranted against the American healthcare system for a really long time. Uh, insurance is a fucking scam. But I have been personally witnessing how a person with cancer has been denied essential care because their insurance has basically made an arbitrary decision that actually you don't need this care and there's no reason for it. And like this person that I know is very lucky in that their doctor is, is fighting their insurance for them, but that's because it's fucking necessary care for their cancer. And like, there are so many people in America who have to do this shit alone and who have to do it without insurance, even do it without insurance and who have to fight their shitty insurance without the help of their doctors, because so many doctors in America just write off people's pain and think that it's them being hysterical and that it's them pretending to, for whatever fucking reason, like lots it's... of people don't even have primary care physicians anymore. Like people oh, yeah. when you go fill out forms are like, who's your primary care physician? Like I didn't have a primary care physician up until like three years ago because like, yeah. that's not how our healthcare system is work is built. Even though people act like it's still the 1950s and that's how it works. Like most people yeah. don't have that. Most people go to ER or an urgent care because they can't af- – they, they wait until things get desperate because they can't afford to go. They can't afford right. primary care. Exactly. It's it's just absolutely fucking insane. And so I've just been uh, railing against how angry I am at insurance and against fucking doctors who just don't give a shit. Like, why go into medicine and, and specifically patient care – if you don't care about patients and I just like, I just can't understand it. It makes me so upset. And like, I understand too, we're, we're living in a, in a fucking pandemic where people treat doctors very shitty. But if your whole job is to care for people very specifically, that's not COVID related and you just don't care to do your job. Like I'm pretty fucking angry about that. And I'm, I'm feeling the frustration about why people are, are so upset with the American health. It's not even American health care. It's just American, like, in, it's the American medical industrial scam. And, like, I don't know how else to explain it. And so I've been very frustrated with that the last two weeks. So I'm just going to keep it at that because I can rant about this for, like, a whole fucking hour. So that's my rant. It's insurance is a scam. It is insane that we pay so much money and then get so fucking little back for it. America is a scam, man. Not oh, one. America's a huge. Capitalism's a scam. For a, for a country that's like, oh, we're this like great nation of all of Name a one like federalized system that is not fundamentally broken. I'll yeah. wait. Oh wait, you can't. <laughs> yeah, it's all fucking broken. Impossible. Absolutely fucking broken. That's why our country, like our country, is held together by like the sweat and literal like tears and breakdowns of like non for profits. <laughs> like yes, totally. Anyways, <laughs> where, Anyways. <laughs> like, one more thing happening from, like, an actual, like, societal collapse in this country. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Woof. My rant is that I don't like to paint ceilings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like painting at all. It's not a, It's the prep. It's the, like, sanding and the taping and the cleaning and the filling of the holes and the la la la. It's the worst. Also, painting a ceiling is particularly hard if you're like, oh, I just got to touch this up because this hasn't been painted in forever. But if you're not painting it a different color and you're just painting it a white, it's hard to tell where you paint it. <laughs> it's really hard <laughs> until it dries and then you get some natural light in there and you're like, oh, I missed so much of that ceiling. <laughs> oh. Also, I have like a lot of neck pain and so I have to like crunch my neck. Even though I have one of those long sticks. <laughs> and no matter how many drop cloths you put down, there's always going to be paint on your hardwood floor. It's the worst. Yeah, bless. I mean, yeah. That's why I you sh- hire a professional. <laughs> okay, the last time I hired a professional, they did an okay job. They honestly didn't do a better job than I am doing, which I understand it didn't cause me a lot of grief. <laughs> <laughs> but part of me was like, oh, I should just do this. I haven't painted my first floor, which is, like, open concept and, like, very large. I will be hiring somebody to do that. There's oh, my... yeah. Do not do that yourself. <laughs> I can't paint that ceiling. <laughs> no way. No. <laughs> so. Absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> but this bed, this guest bedroom, 
and the office. Oh, the office I painted, and I did that design on the ceiling that took five coats. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> looks good, though. The office looks great, especially Your since I great. hung those shelves and all my sexy art that is my husband husband's Zoom background. <laughs> Congratulations. I told him to blur his background. He's like, brum, brum, brum. he's like, well, then you're just gonna have Hannibal carrying Will, <laughs> like, and you're gonna have a pomegranate getting fingered, and you're gonna have, like that's just that's just the reality you live in, man. Well, at least the people that he's talking to have something interesting to look at. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty nice collage of like sexy dumb nerd art. <laughs> some of it's not sexy. Some of it's just them like you know. Hugging it out. <laughs> Ridiculous. Hey, I put the one where Aziraphale and Crowley are fucking in the Bentley in the podcast studio, so I feel like I showed a lot of restraint. I mean, I would agree with that. <laughs> That's the one that I always stared at in the old podcast studio. Like, yep, there's that There's that piece of art again. <laughs> oh, yep, they are just fucking in the Bentley. Aziraphale yep. has no pants on. <laughs> sure doesn't. <laughs> hey, you know what? It's just who I am as a person. That's true. Just it's who you are. <laughs> What's your rave? My rave is World Series baseball. I, if you follow me on Instagram, you may have noticed that the only photos I've fucking posted for <laughs> last like three months are books that I've finished and photos of me and my husband at baseball games <laughs> because I I've been very lucky this year to go to a lot of baseball games, but he's gone to a shitload because he and his friends decided a few weeks into the season that they were going to get season tickets for the White Sox. And so he's been going to, I think he said he went to 25, 26 home games last year, like a show. And I, I think I wound up going to like seven or eight, but it felt like a lot. And then we also went to a couple of like minor league games and we drove to um, uh, Wisconsin and went to a Brewers game also, which was cool. They were playing the White Sox, so it was also a White Sox game, but it was cool to get to see a new studio. Uh, studio. That's what that's called. A new stadium. It's a sports studio. <laughs> it's a sports studio, you know, one of those sports studios. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's something that we try to do when we go on vacation together is go to new studios. God damn, I did it again. Go to new stadiums. <laughs> go to new stadiums. Uh, mostly for baseball, but also, like, when we were in Europe, we went to a couple of soccer stadiums. Uh, that's something that we like doing together. And I have been really enjoying the run up to the playoffs. Part of it, it helps a lot that I love the White Sox and that they, in general, were doing very well while we're recording. They were doing terribly in their first playoff game against the Astros. They did score. Michael texted me while we were recording. He was like, they didn't get shut out. And I was like, fuck, thank God. <laughs> so I hope they do better in the rest of this series. But even if they don't, like... I still love World Series playoff baseball. Like, there's something about it that's very exciting. It's the time where, like, all of the chaos happens in baseball. And, like, baseball is a... uh, It's a hard sport because it's very long. Games can take a super fucking long time. But one of the things that I like about it is that, like, I can read my book. And I can... (sighs) I used to get a lot of shit. People would give me a lot of shit for bringing a book to a game. And it's like, yeah, but I get four minutes in between these pitchers warming up where there's nothing happening and I don't feel bad anymore. I don't feel bad that I brought my book and I'm going to read five Who gave five you shit? Pages. Like strangers? I get people who were like, ugh, people who bring books to games, like strangers who are sitting there. And then also like people that I knew who were like, oh God, I can't believe you bring a book. And it's like, first of all, you don't know me at all. I bring a book literally everywhere. First of all. <laughs> also, if you ride public transportation in the city, what the fuck else am I supposed to do? Of course I'm going to have a book. I had to get here. So, duh, I'm going to have a book with me. And so I've just, like, embraced being that person who's, like, especially now that I'm, like, obviously pregnant, I'm like, well, are you going to say shit to me about anything? Like, I'm deeply uncomfortable. I have to pee every other inning. Like, get off my dick. Like, you just have to I'm start bringing read. scary books. Like, <laughs> books that I'm will bringing... make people be like, what? <laughs> I don't want to talk to her. I've been bringing small books too, which for some reason, if you bring like a a very short book, people don't mind it in the same way. But like, if you have a hardcover book at something, people look at you weird. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I will read anytime, anywhere. I've read at funerals. I don't give a <laughs> shit. You read it. <laughs> 
Uh, we're never assholes. Done. We like weaponize our reading, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you feel bad that you don't read. I just don't talk to me ever. <laughs> I'm not interested in it. But anyway, back to baseball. Like I, I am very happy that I got Michael and I went to the last uh, White Sox home game of the season before they were officially transitioned into the playoffs, which was great. I, we went with um, his brother and his dad, which was the first time that I'd gone to a game with his dad that season. And so it was like a nice outing with my in-laws, which was really fun, actually. And like, it made me also feel very grateful that like, I'm glad I have in-laws I like, and I'm glad that I've been very lucky to have like a family that I've been accepted into that I'm like, okay, I can embrace the things that you guys like and you guys can bring me in as part of your family. So it was nice. It was like, ah, yes, baseball is like a family experience. This is things you can do together with your family. Ah, a thing that people do. <laughs> so I've been Shared really hobbies? baseball. I don't... <laughs> what? You have things that you like together? How strange. <laughs> So I've been really enjoying baseball and I will enjoy it all the way to the end. I'm very happy the Yankees are out. Fuck the Yankees. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't, I haven't picked a team yet. Should the White Sox get eliminated in the, in the playoffs, but I will, I'll watch all the games. I don't even care. It'll be fun. Baseball's fun. What's your rave? I just have a question before I move on to my rave. Yes. What is the most aggressive like reading you've ever done? Like what is like, Mine is still when I sat front row in that play you were in. <laughs> yeah, I read Romeo and Juliet, or not uh, at Romeo and Juliet. I don't even remember what you were reading. I don't remember what I was reading, but I was front row, and it was day daylight because it was outdoor theater. And I, anytime yep. Aaron wasn't on stage, I just was like, "Well, fuck this play," which is I will really shitty, this. really like rude, but also like I don't know. Those people sucked. <laughs> Yeah, I as people and as actors, it, it's mostly that they sucked as people, <laughs> less that yes. they sucked as actors. So I'm like, yes. I'm an asshole, but I'm like not that much of an asshole. <laughs> yeah, and I was the one that was in the play, and I was like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I put it so down when you were on stage. That's all that matters. I know. <laughs> I'm aware. Um, uh, let me think. What's the most aggressive reading I've done? Um, hmm. This seems very shitty, but like, okay, so here's here's the context of this. Ugh. Michael and I had only been dating for like a couple of months when his grandmother died, and <gasps> I met her, and I really liked her, but I hadn't met any of his other family yet, and so we went to her memorial service several months after she had died, Aaron. and... I brought a book with me because I was like, I literally don't know anyone. And I don't, I don't want to be your girlfriend. Who's like tagging along that you have to introduce to your family while you're all grieving. That feels yeah. very shitty and inappropriate. And so I asked him before we left, I was like, do you mind if I bring a book? Like I'll sit in the corner basically by myself and like, I will read this book alone. And he was like, no, I don't care. That's fine. I understand why you're doing this. But then he told me later, a bunch of his family members were like, what the fuck is up with your girlfriend? <laughs> like, doesn't she want to meet us? And he was like, no, this is awkward as fuck. <laughs> I don't even remember what it was. I think it was like a book of poetry too. And I was just like, I'm sorry. I don't know any of you. And I don't know how to comfort any of you because I only met this woman once. Like, yeah. I don't know how to handle this situation. And like, again, now I'm very close with all of his family. And I think <laughs> now that they know me, they understand like, yeah. okay, this was probably the most appropriate thing for you to have been doing as opposed to like, hi, I'm Michael's new girlfriend. So nice to meet you at this very tragic occurrence. <laughs> it is funny now that you think, now that I'm thinking about that and the, what you said about baseball and like, Nick was in a wedding not too long ago and I was invited to the rehearsal dinner, which also meant that I had to go to the rehearsal. So I was just sitting in this Catholic church by myself and I Ugh. like knew the bride and groom, but I didn't know anybody else. And so I was like, well, I'm going to read my book. Like, I don't care. And yeah. hilariously, I was reading a certain hunger <laughs> in this Catholic church, which, you know, made me laugh. Perfect. <laughs> but also I was like, I like one of the in-laws or mothers or whatever looked at me weird. And I was like, well, what do you want? You want me to just sit here? 
I don't want to read the Bible. Like, what the fuck do you want from me? I'm not being loud. I'm not inter- interrupting anything. I'm just sitting here quietly, enjoying my book about cannibalism. <laughs> Will you practice this holy matrimony? That also involves cannibalism. It's yeah. just sanctioned by Christ. It's just, it's just Christian cannibalism. I'm on theme. <laughs> it is weird how people get, like, but had I, like, looked at my phone or something, I feel like people would be like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, it is weird that people get yes. so aggressive about you whiffing out a book. It's like, well, you just want me to stay here? I have very intense ADHD. I have to be doing something. Totally. I used to get shit at, like, family reunions all the time about taking a book out. And it was like, and I started telling people that. I was like, if I had my phone out right now, you wouldn't think twice about it and you wouldn't care. And that's way worse for me like it's way worse for me to be doom scrolling all the time as opposed to reading something that i'm enjoying even if i'm not enjoying it it's way better than being on my phone the whole time and also like there's there's also something that people get so pissed about like i have to put my bookmark in and close my book that people are like oh you're being so disrespectful and it's like no i'm not i just don't want to lose my place (laughs) right like i just i'm not gonna fold the fucking page down like some kind of animal like no. I mean, I fold pages down if I own it. I don't care. I mark Disgusting. up my books. Absolutely not. Horrible. I would rather write <laughs> a book money. than fold a page down. I don't, I don't ever want this book. I could rip this book in half if I wanted to. <laughs> I could eat each page after I read it if I felt like it. <laughs> oh, it's like that book that we, the first book we ever read for Maven's Book Club. Um, God, what was that called? Um, by Cheryl Strayed. Um, oh, uh, the hiking wild. <laughs> wild where when she was on the pacific trail and uh was reading she would rip the page out and then burn it for fuel and as i was reading it i was like why are you doing this that's but it makes sense. smart as hell you're not know, gonna it reread it on smart. the trail books are yeah. heavy you need kindling <sighs> i know but it still gave me a lot of anxiety <laughs> i will fuck up a book <laughs> my rave is the movie Venom, Let There Be Carnage. <laughs> I knew you were going to love it. I fucking knew it. <laughs> Here's the thing. There are a bunch of like critics who are like, oh, this is dumb, and this is the mold on the Avengers shower, blah, blah, blah. The fact that critics hate this movie and hate the Venom movies, to me, signals that it's a fucking great adaptation. Like, Yes. <laughs> this is not for you. Not everything is for you, critics, with your highbrow, whatever. This is about like a symbiotic weird monster fucking relationship who likes to get into arguments and eat people. That's the plot. I'm sorry. Eddie and Venom in the comics are weirdly sexual. Like, and by weirdly, I mean, I approve of everything that they do. I'm very, oh, team. Yes, of course. <laughs> like I'm very team. Uh, I can't think of their ship name right now. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so I was very excited going, I had to wait a whole 24 hours. Cause Nick was like, I'll go see it with you. And I was like, Oh, fine. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> it was super fun. I it was short. It's like a solid hour and a half. It's a real like here like the plot is, I'm not spoiling it. The plot is Eddie and Venom break up. <laughs> they are sad. They get back together to fight Carnage and realize that we're better together than we are separate. That's it. <laughs> That's the plot. They have wow. a big fight at the beginning, and they're squabbling, squabbling, and then they have a really big fight, and Venom leaves Eddie's body, and then they are both very sad, and then Carnage comes to kill them, and they're like, well, we got to team up again, and then they're like, wait a minute, we're better together than we are apart. The end. That's it. That's the story. It's incredible. There's a scene after the breakup where Venom goes to a fucking rave, and he's like really sad at a rave. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> It's so good. I love it. Woody Harrelson is over the top and ridiculous. It's all Woody Harrelson. Yeah, it's all like, is it a masterpiece? No. Is it fun as hell? Yeah. It's the best. They love each other. And that's sweet. (laughs) Dope. I like it. (laughs) Also, the post credit if you're like, oh, whatever, I'm not really into this. Like, I just like the MCU. I don't like other shit. The post credit scene is very intense and intense and like, a, oh, my God, foreshadowing, like, oh, uh, the future, everything folds in together, blah, 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 blah. I was like, this is neat. I'm mostly here for the rave scene. <laughs> 
I'm mostly here for Venom making Eddie a bre- like breakfast because Eddie was sad. <laughs> That's nice. Venom was being really nice. <laughs> it's great. If you like Perfect. Venom from the comics, you would like this movie. If you liked Venom the first movie, you would like this movie. Also, what I love about this movie is Tom Hardy is to Venom what Ryan Reynolds is to Deadpool. Like, they genuinely love these characters, understand these characters, and go to bat for these characters. Tom Hardy is a co-author of this script. Like, this is his, like, Mm -hmm. baby. And I love that. I love when actors are so committed to a thing that they're like, no, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. I mean, that's part of the reason, like, I love Star Trek. Like, Leonard Nimoy directed a bunch of those movies. Like, he gave a shit about that stuff. And, like, I, I love it. Nerd shit's better when the people who are in it give a shit. Yes, 100%. And that's I, absolutely true. I'm not saying that you have to, like, grow up and care about it your whole life. You can get cast in a property and then realize, like, oh, wait a minute. This has, like, history this. and I love it and yeah. I respect this, like, fandom and whatever. Like, that's fine. Like, a lot of the, like, Lower Decks voice actors, like, don't have a history of being, like, capital T Trekkies. But, like, they dove in the deep end and they were like, this is fun and you guys love this and we like being a part of this and we want to learn about Star Trek. And, like, that's great. Like, I just want actors to care about the properties that they're in. I don't care if you were a lifelong fan. Who gives a shit? Mm-hmm. Also, Tom Hardy's hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hilarious. I'm just saying. If anybody wants Just some uh, good Venom thick links, <laughs> I got them. They're good. Of course. And of course wild. He Look, he can make tentacles out of his body. <laughs> also, he can go in. Any, he, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> it's my rave. Highly recommend Venom, the movie. <laughs> I think the first one's better, but like this one is also great. And the rave scene. Come on. It's so good. He wears glow sticks? <laughs> oh, I've seen. I've seen the the photos from the rave scene. I think it's very funny. But he's sad. It's a sad rave. <laughs> Been there. Been there. Uh, we do have one Peg Mary kill. Okay. Do you want to do that? Yeah, we have a Peg Mary kill from Jolene. Um, it is young Chekhov. So Chekhov before the movies. Okay. Data. And Jeff Spender. So this is an X-Trex <laughs> Peg Mary kill. Rude, Jolene. <laughs> Fucking rude. She's a bitch. <laughs> uh, okay. Young, wish I was Davy Jones, Chekhov. <laughs> Fucking Spender. And who was the third one? Data. Uh, fuck. <laughs> oh. I don't actually have an answer for this. All right, you should go first because I'm not sure. Oh, I said I don't have one, but I can come up. I guess kill Chekhov because I think he's like 17. <laughs> and I'm yeah. fully not into that. And yeah. his hair is truly a mess. So I guess kill him. Um, I don't feel like I know enough about Spender, but I do know that like people who work in government, like, are married to their job, so maybe if I married him, I wouldn't have to spend <laughs> a lot of time with him. <laughs> so maybe marry him because he probably won't be around that much. And doesn't he also get killed? So like he'll get off. I mean, eventually, yes, he does, but he so. makes it a while. Well, I could be having a lot of Alyssa affairs while he's, you know, at the office true. shredding, <laughs> shredding paperwork. <laughs> Also, he's got some pretty beautiful lips. So, <laughs> look, <Your weakness. laughs> I like big shoulders, thick thighs, and big lips. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm a more is more person. <laughs> I never went through like a skinny boy emo phase. That was never me. People were like, "Oh, I love." alkaline trio or whatever and i was like cool i really like alec baldwin (laughs) i'm 16 (laughs) so weird so weird oh my god Uh. and then have sex with data because he's like fully functional and like programmed and many like sexual blah 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 i don't know and i'd only have to do it once 
Yeah, that's true. Or peg data. <laughs> it would be weird to peg an Android. <laughs> yeah, it would be weird to peg an Android. <laughs> like, what? It would be What's like, point? okay. <laughs> Can you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's my answer, I guess. Uh, okay, I think I would... I think I would kill Data. I just find him so fucking irritating. Correct. Kill Data. Peg Spender. Child Bride Chekhov? (laughs) Yes. Marry Chekhov. Don't have sex with him until he's an adult. Because I like him as an adult, and I know that he matures. So you're going to groom Chekhov. (laughs) I mean, Chekhov is already groomed. I can just see into the future. (laughs) Okay. Child Bride Chekhov. Also, to, who, what are you talking about? Married to their job. He's married to the fucking Enterprise. He'd be gone all the time. That's true. You can't marry a person on the Enterprise. That's the, uh, See you in eight years, I guess. If you survive, <laughs> goodbye. Right? We'll get married before he leaves. It's like marrying someone who's going off to World War II. You're like, you know, you don't want to die alone, yeah. not married. You can be Here's a virgin. my picture but... for your right. pocket exactly. or whatever. Have a nice time in space. I'll see you when you're of legal age. <laughs> Tell your captain I think he's cute. Bye. <laughs> uh, that was a good one. Also very rude. <laughs> this was a weird podcast. We did it. This was a weird podcast. All also, over the place. Uncharacteristically short for us. <laughs> I like it. I did too. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, it's still an hour. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Good energy. Sort of. Except for I just got so excited about my books that I just like rambled. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. These are pretty good. <laughs> yeah that's your brand that's your energy <laughs> I just get excited about the things i like easy to do well, that's All it right. that's oh. it okay oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we both try to end it i'm keeping that in i feel like it was like cute and relatable or maybe yeah, people sure. will be like "Ugh, i hate these girls why do i listen <laughs> why did you make it to the end then because <laughs> it's uncharacteristically short <laughs> uh Right. Oh, you know what? Actually, before we wrap this up, because this is pretty short and I didn't have this as my rave, I'm so fucking glad Hangman Page is back. Yeah! I was so excited about oh, yeah, it. Here we, here we go wrestling at the very end. If you made it this far and you hate us, here, you're welcome. You can uh, have a little wrestling as a treat. That's a, it's a treat. I was so excited. We were behind because Michael and I both went to the gym and so we got home and I happened to open Twitter right as someone tweeted about him being the Joker and so I knew right as the match was starting that he was coming back and Michael saw it on my face. He was like, don't fucking tell me. I know you know who I mean, it is. Don't tell me. You had to know, right? Like, I mean, I didn't really think about it to be honest because I oh. like... I have I mean, to I write the morning diet of my preview so I have to think about it and I was like, it has to be Hangman Adam Page, right? Who else would I didn't, it be? It literally didn't even occur to me because I was like, oh, he's on he's on paternity leave. I'm sure he'll come back eventually. But like, duh, obviously it was going to be him. This was like the only way to reinsert him back into the title picture. It makes absolute perfect fucking sense. If they couldn't give him the title at all out, like this is the perfect way to do it. Yeah. It fits in with the character that they've been telling. Like, I was so he got fucking such a good excited pop. to see like, Everybody loves oh. Hangman Page. Like, it's going to be oh. so satisfying when he wins. <sighs> Oh my god, I'm gonna cry when he is the first person in AEW to kick out of the one winged angel. I'm gonna lose my fucking shit. I'm so excited about it. Like, it's so nice to feel excited about wrestling. Like, I know people are like very excited about Punk and Brian and Cole, and like, I am in some ways as well, but like, I'm way more excited about Hangman Page being back than I am about because any of those three guys. This is a two year long storyline. Like, this yes. is a payoff, man. Like, yeah. this is. Whether it was planned long term or if they just like rolled with the punches and they were like, we can see it now, like whatever, like this is peak, like peak wrestling storytelling, like yeah, the investment, this- like yes, everyone loves him. He's had his ups and downs, like he, and also on top of that, he seems like a genuinely, actually good person. So I don't have to feel bad about cheering oh for him. God, also, he's a like dreamboat. Oh, oh, tens I know. across right. the board, tens across the board. <laughs> Yes, and also I feel like Hangman Page was popular on the indies. It's not like he didn't have already a name for himself when he came to AEW, but he still manages to feel like a homegrown AEW star. And, like, I feel like they have made such a great investment in him that it feels like this payoff is so fucking worth it that I'm, I'm so excited about it. I cannot wait for him to win the title. I, like... 
I like that AEW has been doing some surprising things. I thought it was very surprising that Sheeta didn't win her fucking 50th win match. I thought that was a great storytelling choice. Yeah. But because she's one still things... going to be the first woman with a 50 win, right? But they Absolutely. like made a big yeah. deal about it. And like, that was, I love watching Serena Deep wrestle. She's so good. She's very good. And like, I'm very excited that they finally gave the women a second title. That's it's very exciting. Than the main belt. The TVS title it's is so much like better. really nice. It's so much. It's it's the size of a real belt. It doesn't look like it's a novelty a egg. Lady it's, belt. It's so oh, but much my better. arms are so weak. I can't pick it up. I have to fit it around my wee little waist. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, so I'm like excited about some of the choices they're making. But one of the things AEW does best is that fans want something and they give it to them. And I'm so excited to finally get Hangman Page as champion. Like it's going to be so fucking satisfying. I can't wait for it. So I'm very excited about that. So there's an additional wrestle rave at the end for Yay, everyone. We did it. <laughs> Yay, we did it. <laughs> uh, all right. You can find us on the internet. You can find me on Instagram at NYD urgency. Unless it goes down. You can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Stella underscore cheeks. You can follow the production podcast thing you can follow all of our podcasts at nyd productions on both instagram and on twitter and use the hashtag hashtag not your demo pod to follow along with this podcast specifically you can subscribe to our patreon at nyd productions where there's all kinds of shit and you can enter at the low low level of just one dollar if you can give us more if you want obviously we're super into that but we <laughs> want to make this successful so you can just give us a dollar and you can get access to all of our content including all of every mania evers including our very real mitch plungy <laughs> stand cast on official channels you can get access to all of our show notes for extracts and all of our bloopers which Honestly, sometimes the bloopers are just as good as the extra show. I listen to them every week because I think they're very funny. <laughs> we record so far in advance that I forget. And then I listen to the bloopers and I'm like, what is this? It's all just extended like like panic attacks by me. <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> and most importantly, you get access to our uh, Patreon only Discord, which is really fun. Yes. It, I don't use it a ton because I'm an old and I'm very bad and I don't have it on my phone. But I every time I log on to it, I read all of the stuff that I missed. And I'm like, this is like an old message board. I love this. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. Sidebar, <laughs> I did maybe join a Supernatural Discord and it has taken over a lot of my life and I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> I like Discord now. I'm not an old anymore. I'm young and hip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that makes you not hip. <laughs> no, no, no. It makes me very hip. I got low rise jeans and and frosted. <laughs> I I can't even pretend. <laughs> so you frosted tip, You frosted it with the paint that fell yeah, out on you from your ceiling. <laughs> unintentional frosting. I might be going blind in one eye because I did get a lot of paint. In it. <laughs> Listen, if you have to wear an eye patch, nothing is more hip than that. <laughs> yes, sexy bisexual pirate, the dream. Um, I think that's it. You can email us at nowyourdemo at gmail.com. Rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends. I don't know. Tell us about the books you're reading. Whatever you want. Absolutely. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Uh, uh, and in the meantime, mark out. Fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs> Goodbye. Kind of like a bird call. Fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs>